Harvard Divinity School. The Necessity of Exile, Essays from a Distance and End of Days Ethics, Tradition, and Power in Israel, February 7th, 2024. Welcome to this uh, incredible opportunity for this really rich discussion. I'm so delighted that you're all here and welcome our audience online. Uh, and again, want to say thank you for participating in this uh, important series of conversations. So I'm Diane Moore. I'm the Associate Dean of Religion and Public Life here at Harvard Divinity School. And this particular event is sponsored by our Religion, Conflict, and Peace Initiative, which is a, one of the branches of Religion and Public Life. Um, the RCPI, uh, Religion, Conflict, and Peace Initiative, centralizes an analysis of injustice, violence, and power and examines how a more capacious understanding of religion can yield fresh insights into contemporary challenges and opportunities for just peace building. The uh, mission statement for religion and public life is to promote the public understanding of religion in service of a just world at peace. So this RCPI initiative falls within that frame and this discussion is very much related to those questions. We're delighted to have this conversation about these two really rich and critically important books uh, with our two authors, Shaul Majid. I always, I'm sorry, I keep going to call you Majid, and I know it's Majid, so apologies for that, and Mikhail uh, Manikin. So both of them are RCPI fellows with us this year, and we're delighted to be able to offer this opportunity to highlight these two important texts. Uh, they will be in discussion with our dear friend and beloved colleague, Italia Omer, whom I will introduce, and then Italia will introduce more fully our authors. Italia Omer is Professor of Religion, Conflict, and Peace Studies at the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies and the Keough School of Global Affairs at the University of Notre Dame. She is also T.J. Dermot Dumphy, Visiting Professor of Religion, Violence, and Peace Building here at Harvard Divinity School and a senior fellow in our conflict and peace program. Her book, Days of Awe, Reimagining Jewishness and Solidarity with Palestinians is highly relevant to this conversation today. She also has several other books that I will not delineate here because we won't get to our conversation, uh, but I also encourage you to read her latest book, Decolonizing Religion and Peace Building, and we had a forum on that just two weeks ago here. So uh, please welcome our guests and uh, Professor Omer, who will introduce our, uh, our authors for today. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Professor Moore. Um, so kind of the, uh, the framing for the event today is really to, to provide an opportunity to think through uh, the books on their, on their own terms, but also bring them together uh, in ways that will, will generate a conversation that will be meaningful and um, meaningful for the time, for the moment in which we are. Uh, so uh, Michael Manekin uh, is a religion and public fellow in, co in Conflict and Peace at the Religion and Public Life Program, uh, RCPI at Harvard Divinity School. And among his many forms of activism, he is the director of the Alliance Fellowship Program on Arab-Jewish Political Network in Israel. He is also a former director of Breaking the Silence, an Israeli veterans group focused on educating the public about the occupation of Palestinians. Um, and Michael is, an, is one of the, the key leaders of uh, a new movement uh, called the Faithful Left, uh, a movement of religious Jews in Israel promoting equality, through the language and prisms of the Jewish tradition. So the book is very much coming from, from this place. Um, and Professor and Rabbi Shaul Magid is a distinguished fellow in Jewish studies at Dartmouth Co College and also a visiting professor of modern Jewish studies here at Harvard. He is um, a public intellectual and an incredibly prolific author. Um, on a rich array of topics in Jewish studies. Um, an incomplete list of his books include Hasidism, uh, Incarnate, Hasidism, Christianity, and the Construction of Modern Judaism that came out with Stanford in 2014. And um, most recently, before this most recent book, 
I think it was most recently, but I have a feeling there was another book in between, Mayor Kahana, The Public Life and Political Thought of an American Jewish uh, Radical that came out with Princeton University Press in 2021. Um, and, uh, the, uh, and of course, the focus of today's um, discussion and the voice that uh, Professor Magid will um, articulate is about the necessity, the, the title of the book, The Necessity of Exile, Essays from a Distance, which came out with Ayn Press. Um, and so, and as you know, the, the book uh, that um, uh, Michael brought, End of Days, Ethics, Tradition, and Power in Israel, uh, is a very, very fresh, recent English translation, but um, the Hebrew uh, the, the book came out in Hebrew, um, and I had the privilege of reading it both in Hebrew and English, and it was amazing to see that something did get lost in translation. <laughs> uh, so I think it will be important to, to bring that into uh, the conversation. So in terms of the, the format, um, uh, we'll start with a brief overview uh, of about five to seven minutes from each, uh, and then... Um, I have a few questions with int the intentionality behind the questions to facilitate the conversation, but also bring out, uh, again, as I said, kind of generative uh, motifs that will be um, applicable for, for, for the current moment for questions about um, uh, Jewish power um, and also uh, Jewish eth uh, power, Jewish ethics, Jewish politics, and, um, and Jewish constructive uh, and peace building oriented um, work. So, um, so we'll start, and then we'll open up uh, to uh, Q and A. And I kind of, I, I, I think it will be a very organic conversation. So, uh, Shul, do you want to start with your piece? Uh, no, no. I mean, whatever you feel comfortable. Okay. Um, I was saying to, I was saying to Yael, um, Michael's wife, yesterday that I think what I would rather happen is that I would talk about his book. Uh, and he would talk about my book, but we didn't have any time. Oh. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> and, and 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 I say that because I I take some responsibility for for Michael's book because I also when I read it in the Hebrew, um, I had to twist his arm to agree to translate it into English because he didn't want to translate it. In, he didn't want it to be published in English because he thought that it's really an Israeli story and he didn't really think that it would reach a diaspora audience. So in order to basically convince him to do this, I agreed to write a forward which try to situate it. But uh, he will say why he thinks it was some of it was lost in translation. Um, so I want to just talk for a few minutes about, about the necessity of exile. And one of the things that's interesting between both of our books is that our own positionality really plays a very central role um, in the book. It starts, it, Michael's book starts with a personal story, with a personal anecdote, and the person is really kind of exists throughout the book. And, and that's true with my book as well. I mean, I have a separate chapter, My Tragic Love Affair with Zionism, where it's really an autobiographical chapter of, of my relationship with and eventually um, uh, or becoming more complicated as time goes on with Zionism. So I wanted to just say a few very, very short things because we'll get a chance to get into it more in the Q&A. And that is um, how the book is, has been somewhat misunderstood in, in at least a couple of ways. Um, the book is not anti-Israel, but it is anti-Zionist. And it's precisely about trying to make a distinction between Zionism as a political ideology and Israel as a nation state. So in some way, uh, I call I, I I you know I had to come up with a brand with the word, so I called it counter Zionism, and the basic assumption of counter Zionism is that Zionism as a political ideology comes into existence in the 19th century, maybe the late 18th century, and in some way, in as all national ideologies is very complex and very uh, problematic, but also drove this project that eventually became. Uh, the state of Israel. And uh, the assumption of the book is that um, Zionism has done its work. And it, it, you know, in, in, in all the messy ways that nationalisms do their work. And that it doesn't really provide a good map or template for thinking about the coexistence of a Jewish state that has a significant population of, of non-Jews. So it's really about trying to th rethink the notion of Israel 
beyond Zionism or after Zionism. And the other distinction that I want to make, and the person that, that published a very, very generous uh, review of the book in the New York Times kind of missed this point, is the distinction between diaspora and exile. And the book is not about diasporaism. The book is about exile. And the, I begin with an anecdote that in May 1942, there was something called the Biltmore Conference where David Ben-Gurion and Chaim Weizmann came to New York to try to convince American Zionists to get on board with their status project because American Zionism was not status at that time. And the, 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 the American Zionists agreed on one condition, that America would no longer be called Galut, exile, but Gola, diaspora. And Ben-Gurion agreed, he eventually rescinded on that promise, but he eventually, he did agree to say, okay, America is not exile, but diaspora, because exile will seem to be a negative, pejorative term. And what I'm trying to argue in the book is just the opposite, that I'm trying to reinstate exile as a healthy and crucial positionality in understanding Jewish existence, not only for the Jews that live in the diaspora, but for the Jews that live in the state of Israel as well. Because the problem of ending exile, the problem of forgetting exile is that the problem of thinking that history has been fulfilled, the problem of thinking that the Jewish question has been answered very, very easily, maybe inevitably, but even if not inevitably, very easily slides into a certain kind of ethno-national chauvinism, which is, I think, where Israel is mired today. And the notion of exile as, as a more humbling position of this is not the end, the not yet, history has not been fulfilled, does two things. First of all, it keeps alive the possibility of a better future. And it also allows those Jews who are living in the land of Israel, in the state of it, which is now the state of Israel, to rethink their own responsibility, and here is where it kind of dovetails with, with Michael's book, to think, rethink their own responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the people that they live with, without thinking that they are part of some kind of redemptive messianic vision on the one hand, or rejecting the messianic idea altogether on the other. And I think that Zionism does one of two things. Either it argues for the fulfillment of the messianic idea, or it argues for the erasure of the messianic idea. And I think both of those are mistaken. And the implementation of exile as a positionality within the existence of Jewish life in the diaspora and in Israel holds the potential for a certain sense of humility on the one hand, that also keeps alive the possibility of creating something better. So that, that's what I try to do in the book, and um, um, I hope you, uh, you, you find it helpful. So I'll stop here. Um, yeah, uh, so thank you. And it, um, before I talk about the loss in translation, I will say that it's, the book is excellently translated by, um, by um, a, a good friend and activist, an anti-occupation activist, uh, Maya Rosen. Um, but, but the question of translation, I think, is going to be a lot of our conversation uh, here in general because um, um, in, in terms of the themes that uh, Shows uh, writes about in his book, uh, I think I'm writing from a very similar, let's call it theological and political outlook, but from a perspective of somebody whose home uh, is in Israel. I've had uh, the tremendous fortune over the last two decades um, to be involved in anti-occupation activism. That's been my sort of profession uh, for the last uh, 20 years. There's a guy here who was one of the founders of Breaking the Silence, and he roped me in along with some other people. Um, and I've had the, the really good fortune of, of being involved in that um, struggle while living as an Israeli, raising my kids um, in Israel, and to make it perhaps more challenging um, in the perspective of, of our conversation, um, living within a, let's call it, religious Zionist community uh, in the sense that um, I send my kids to religious Zionist education. Um, I, uh, I pray in a synagogue uh, that is religious Zionist. Um, so structurally, formally, formally I, I belong to um, a community 
that I am theologically and politically increasingly opposed to. Uh, and the book is really an attempt to try to explain uh, myself, first and foremost to myself and to my kids, but try to explain um, uh, the, the political and theological tradition that I belong to, um, and, and A, try to figure out what happened to it, meaning what happened to the religious political perspective um, which viewed moderate, moderacy, empathy, compassion, um, sort of a general, I would say, hesitancy um, and skepticism of violence, maybe not pacifism, but, but skepticism of violence, which perhaps was associated with um, my grandparents' or great-grandparents' generations of Jews. What happened that today when we close our eyes and we imagine a religious person in Israel, we imagine the opposite uh, virtues. Uh, and um, we would imagine somebody who is really the voice of aggression. Um, um, many times, increasingly in, in recent months, um, voices of vengeance. Uh, so what happened in, that, in, the, in, in this time period that we're living in that that tradition was lost? And is it even possible to reconstruct that tradition in a political perspective in a time where um, Jews are living in Israel and have, and we have, the type of power and privileges that we have. So th those are really the questions that I'm trying to wrestle with. And I would say I'm both trying to understand that um, within uh, religious communities in Israel, but also with left communities in Israel, which tend to be at least self-perceive themselves as very um, secular or non-practicing religious. So that sort of in-between point where on one hand um, you are viewed as a, let's call it an anomaly within the religious community, but also viewed as an anomaly um, within the left activist world is, is sort of a, what I'm trying to write um, about. I would say that what um, I come up with uh, is in a sense a form, I, I very much ag agree with what uh, Scholes said about exile, definitely in the theological sense. Um, um, uh, the book is, is primarily about, or parts of it are primarily about the fact that um, I, I don't view uh, Israel as the beginning of redemption, um, which is, maybe I'll say something about translation. The book in, Israel, in, in Hebrew is called the which means really the beginning of redemption or the dawn of redemption. Uh, and it's translated to English as the end of days. Um, <laughs> I find that, first of all, the minute we thought of that, I said we definitely need to do it and not explain. Um, I find it fascinating that the dawn of redemption and end of days are, are, are the same phrase, are, mean the same thing uh, in terms of how we define uh, the beginning of redemption. Um, it's just that I felt that in the American context, if I call it the dawn of redemption, uh, the irony wouldn't be it, the, the irony would pass over sort of the American audience, and I felt end of days maybe is a bit more uh, apt. Uh, back to um, sort of the theme of exile, in that sense, um, the theological perspective is that um, all Jews are living in exile, including in the land of Israel, until the redemption comes, and the redemption is not a, a political one in the sense that, in the Zionist sense, that we will take away, um, or we will take power uh, and, and construct uh, our own redemption, um, but rather the redemption um, is one that we pray to um, and have a, a, a dialogue um, uh, with God about. Um, so in that sense, I think um, there is um, a very much a connection uh, between uh, the, the the theories and the the thoughts in in both books, um, what increasingly becomes relevant for me, and maybe I'll I'll end off with this at least beginning this, is that uh, the question of how a Jewish state should behave is one which I'm not really interested in in the book. Um, I think that the minute that you ask that question, you really disconnect yourself from the ability to ask what's more important for me, which is how a Jewish individual sh should behave or how a community should behave. Um, and that's why this book isn't 
a Zionist book or a non-Zionist book or an anti-Zionist book or a post-Zionist book, it's just not really that focused on that question. Um, the question that's interesting for me is how should a Jew behave in any context and in, in, in the given situation in Israel, how should one behave in a context where not only do we have um, incredible amount, uh, incredible amount of power and privilege, um, which does not mean that we're not vulnerable, of course we are, but uh, as any human being is, but um, but we do have incredible amount of power and privilege. Um, uh, but also a lot of the words that I uh, find significant to my religious world are already being used in the secular world. So uh, you end up living a type of double life in which words mean one thing to you and another thing to the state. And how do you have that conversation is really my focus. Maybe I will say, lastly, about that, the book is constructed as a virtue ethics book. Um, that's the language that I'm trying to... Uh, a Jewish virtue ethics book is a language which I'm trying to reconnect with um, from a ethical moral perspective. There is a tremendous amount of Jewish literature, um, primarily in the Middle Ages, but not only about how, what are the virtues of, for lack of a better word, good uh, Jew, and what are those vices. And my attempt is to try to have a conversation with those virtues in the current political sense. So maybe that's a good beginning. Great. Uh, so um, I, I'm actually going to um, invite you now to, um, in, in many respects, reflect on one another's book because on the tensions that emerge, uh, because the books are not saying the same things. And it, again, it it does relate to the different positionalities. Uh, so um, in rereading the books, <laughs> I identified differences in how you approach questions of home. Exile or dias and, and diaspora, Jewish power, um, and Zionism. Uh, so I want to invite you to reflect on how you understand the convergences and divergences in your approaches. Um, does the tension between the positions relate to uh, Shaul's counter Zionist position? And perhaps you want to unpack a little bit more counter Zionism, how is it different or the same um, than anti Zionism? Um, so counter Zionist position that offers um, kind of sites of reclaiming exile from Zionist erasures and negations. And Michael, your effort uh, to invest religious ethics in political realities in the land without abrogating the Zionist frame. So if you can reflect on maybe tensions, convergences, divergences, um, and, it, uh, and it does go to the issue of the positionalities. Yeah. I think uh, I'll start. I think that um, there there are certainly interesting overlaps with the book, but I think there are also some some differences. And so the counter Zionism position that I suggest is one whereby um, uh, people say to me, um, "Oh, if it's anti-Zionist, it's anti-Israel," and 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 uh, and I'm, I try to disabuse them of that. That's not what I'm saying. Um, it's also not, for example, I mean, the book does engage with Judith Butler and Daniel Boyarin a great deal, and I have a lot of respect for both of them and for their positions, for the cosmopolitan position of Judith Butler and for the diasporic nationalism of Boyarin, but mine is really a different project because I am assuming the existence of the state of Israel um, as it uh, because this, because it exists on some level, and people will say, "Well, does does Israel have a right to exist?" And Israel has as much of a right to exist as any country has a right to exist. I don't think any countries have a right to exist. So I'm not a nationalist. I think nations are brutal, violent places, and that's the world we're living in right now. Maybe it won't be the world we're always going to live in, but that's just. I don't think it's any worse or better than any other nation. Uh, I I do think though that to, to Michael's point, um, I think that, and this is one of, one of the things that I talked about in, in the, my 972 review of his book, that- The Hebrew it, version. The Hebrew version, right? That it really is engaging the question of power. And not only power, the power of the individual, power of the collective. And I know back, you know, I'm old enough to know that back in the 70s and early 80s, that was the very big question. David Hartman, Yitz Greenberg, people were all asking that question. This is the challenge. There's a fascinating 
uh, video or audio of Rav Soloveitchik in the 60s asking that question, what will Jews do with power? Can they actually move from the place of power, so powerlessness to power to maintain the ethics of Michael's grandfather, who is kind of the, the, the ghost that's hovering around the entire book? That was a conversation that I was very much a part of in the 80s. I think to some extent, the answer to that is no, that Israel has not succeeded in using power in an ethical way. Um, not the only one that hasn't, but it hasn't. So I'm not sure that that's really the relevant question anymore. And I think what stands between Michael and, and I on this question is that Michael is saying, can we get back to, because I think, I, think that, I think Michael's book is a Zionist book in some way. Can we get back to a different kind of Zionism that, would, that his grandfather would be proud of, that his grandfather would identify with? In a certain sense, it's a diasporic Zionism because the ethics of his grandfather, not having known his grandfather, but the way it's depicted in the book, is a diasporic Jewish positionality about the relationship to the other. I suppose my question, or I should say my, my suggestion, is that the problem may be not what kind of Zionism, the problem may be Zionism itself. And that that's the reason why, in my view, in some sense, I feel like Israel is banging its head against the wall. Like, it's trying. In some way, it's trying. Oslo was trying. There are real attempts within the Zionist project to get to this moral, ethical place. And it seems to always slip into this kind of chauvinistic model. And, and, and what I'm suggesting is that, that that chauvinism is not an aberration. It's not an aberration. It may be what the thing actually is. And if that's the case, is there a way of thinking otherwise about what it would be to coexist? I use as an example, it's a kind of egregious example, I admit, but I use the example of Manifest Destiny from the, early ninth, from the mid 19th century, which Joseph O'Sullivan developed this idea of Manifest Destiny, which was a justification for the westward movement to the Oregon Territory. It was a horrible policy. It committed genocide against Native Americans and all of that. But I use that example because ideology, because because it's really only very, very, very reactionary right-wing nationalists that still have this idea of manifest destiny. That America's dropped that ideology and that ideologies and the, the things that ideologies produce are not identical. They're not identical. Ideologies can become obsolete and new ideologies can emerge given the realities on the ground. And so there is a kind of trying to put a square peg in a round hole to some degree. And I think that's where Michael and I maybe differ because I think he's still, it, I think his book is more optimistic in some way than mine, that we can find that Zionism of his grandfather. We can find that ethical, moral place that somehow got swept up with the realities of history and the pain of marginalization, and the catastrophe of the Shoah, and all of those things, somehow we can still kind of get back to something that, 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 that you would be proud of and that he would be proud of. And I'm just not so sure that's possible. Um, great. <laughs> um, um, I think maybe it would be helpful for me um, in the context of this conversation to, before I talk about ideologies, rather talk about what I want like on the ground um, and then what language uh, we can talk about ideologically after that because I think so much of the conversation, particularly in national context and very much in the context of Zionism, is a lot of people you know, use those words and mean very different things and then there's very little conversation about what people actually want but the conversation is rather about the ideology surrounding that and I think it's helpful even as an exercise to, to talk about what actually happens on the ground and then say, well, that could be Zionism, that could be not Zionism, what does it really matter uh, as long as we're forwarding X or forwarding Y? Um, so I'll do this obviously um, very um, uh, superficially, um, but, uh, but I'll try my best. Um, there are roughly 20 million um, people uh, living in uh, the land of Israel or the land of Palestine. 
uh, roughly half of them are Jews and roughly half of them are Palestinians. And I am uh, interested and, and, and I am personally very happy about that, meaning I, I would not, I don't see that as, a, as an obstacle that what do we need, what, what are we going to do? There are other people who are not from our religion, but we need to compromise. Uh, rather, I think that it can potentially be a, a beautiful understanding of our region in a different time and in a different future. Uh, and I would um, like in the future that all of those people would have complete um, freedom and ownership as a people uh, of that region in whatever context makes most sense for, most, for, for those people. So that has everything to do with personal political rights, but also national political rights, and also questions of immigration and question of return. Um, so on a personal level, while I um, uh, think that um, in the, and I, I'm, I'm not much of a nationalist either, what are we gonna do? We're living in a nationalist age. Uh, and in the nationalist age that we're living in, um, I think um, uh, it is my understanding that Jews have a, a right to nas national self-determination, just like um, any other people, um, a political right, not a, not a natural one. Um, but obviously not in any sense that that can be at the expense of anybody else. So self-determination is very important for me. A majority is not that important to me. Um, um, taking away the right of return of others is not very important for me. Um, what is important for me is that um, um, I'm able to uh, live um, in, in freedom and in prosperity in the region which I live in, in exactly the same way as Palestinians are. And that doesn't mean that we have the same histories and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's fair from a historical perspective, from any way that you view it, but in the context that I'm in living, na living in now, and as I said, I'm an activist, so I'm primarily future-oriented. I think that's how activists work. That's what's of interest to me. Now, that sounds perhaps like a moderate democratic position. Um, I think in many sense, I see it as a moderate democratic position. Uh, sadly, I think it's considered a relatively radical uh, position in this day and age, I would say on two two points one is a question of um of uh of ownership not meaning there are many uh, i'll speak as an israeli so on the israeli side there are many israelis who think that uh, arab what what they would call arab arab citizens of israel i'll say in the 48 perspective um um deserve equal rights but i equal rights isn't enough i think it needs to be equal ownership so it's not only that palestinians should get uh, the same check as as Jews should get, they should be signing the check uh, in the same way, and that so so that's one point that's important to stress. And the second is that I don't see this as a compromise, uh, which is which is another thing you hear many Israelis and Palestinians saying. Um, you know, what are you going to do? We need to compromise about two states, or we need to compromise and give up land. I I don't see uh, our, my desire to have a for lack of a better term, binational framework as something that I'm giving up on some other idea of an exclusivist. I, I am by no means have any exclusive um, relationship with the state. And I think exclusivism in general is um, a very problematic position. Now, some people would call that an anti-Zionist position, probably at this point most Zionists. Some people would call that a Zionist position I imagine many diaspora Palestinians would call that a Zionist position. So I'm aware of the fact that where you position yourself in this conversation um, has to do um, with um, with that. But as I've um, as I've been called a Zionist in this context, I'll be happy to explain where uh, Zionism is actually very helpful and beneficial for me. Um, after I said that uh, I'm against any exclusivist uh, nature. So first of all, it's my political community. And um, I feel um, that it is not only in the cynical sense, but in the real sense that there's something very um, politically problematic about trying to talk to a community and first disassociating yourself from it, saying, first of all, I want you to know my political community who I'm trying to, trying to convince and trying to have a conversation with. I'm not part of your identity and national ideology. I am beyond that. I am past that. So from an Israeli perspective, and here I think the positionality is actually very important. 
if I'm trying to have a conversation with my political community, uh, I, it's important for me to speak in the language of my community. Um, secondly, I, in many senses, it, it, for, for better or for worse, and many times also for better, I, um, even if I decide ideologically that I'm not a Zionist from a lived experience and from my privileges and um, from my privileges as a citizen, I'm still very much part of a Zionist framework. And a lot of times, this is my conversation with a lot of my um, non-Zionist or anti-Zionist Israeli friends, it's saying you're not a Zionist doesn't mean that you, you automatically don't have the privileges of any Jew living in the country. Um, from a formal perspective, I am very much part of the Zionist project. Maybe I want it to lead to a different conclusion than many Zionists want to, but I, from a formal perspective, um, even no matter what I say, I'm still going to send my children uh, to, um, uh, to Zionist uh, education, because that's the education that there is in the country. Um, I'm still going to benefit from everything that uh, I benefit from uh, as a Jew living in Israel. So pretending as if, if I just say that I'm not part of something will mean that I'm not part of something, I think isn't sort of a serious um, um, personal uh, position. And maybe lastly, um, also in a positive sense, I benefit from uh, a lot of what Zionist, Zionism has created. And even though I'm hypercritical, and in many times very marginal or marginalized uh, in sort of the, the way things are now in the country, you know, I speak with my, fr my children in Hebrew. Um, I feel comfortable uh, um, with their teachers, maybe not on politics, but on just how they care. Uh, for my for for my kids, um, I feel that the project the project or the state has given a lot to me from a lot of different perspectives, and it's important for me. While I'm very critical and while I'm in argument with a lot of that, to be thankful for what that project has given me. Um, so while I am at this point probably diametrically opposed to the theology, not only of religious Zionism but of Zionism in general. I'm also very thankful for a lot of what it has given um, me and my family. And that's um, something which is sometimes hard to wrap one's head around, but that's fine, you know? We're living in a complicated era, and, um, and it's sort of important for me to stress that point. And maybe sort of on the last point of that is that what's interesting for me is that in the Israeli context, when the book came out, there was actually very little conversation about the Zionist element of the book, only, like, only when it's translated to English. So, so then the conversation on Zionism comes up. And I think that has a lot to do with um, viewing Israel as a battle of ideas versus living in Israel as a sort of lived experience. And those, there's not that one is right and one is wrong. It's just yeah. it differs from, from for where you are. Yeah, um, I think you kind of articulated um, the you know the subjectivization yeah. of that that you are a product of, and how you navigate it in 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 this context. Uh, Shul, do you want to respond to anything that Michael uh, uh, put on the table? Uh, well, yeah, there's a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I had something. I sorry, I had something in particular, but. Um, um, let me let me let me just say this. I, I I think that a lot of pushback that we've both been getting, um, both personally and social media and things like that, um, is because uh, we're trying to break through a particular kind of narrative that has become um, very very cemented into certainly the psyche of the American Jewish community. I think Israel is, is, is different and it's always been interesting that the left in Israel has always been far to the left <laughs> of the American left, the American Jewish left on this particular question. I think one of the things that I'd like to bring up is, and, and then I'll give it back to you, Atalia, is that very early on, and and just just as just as as Michael is more future oriented, I think my own training makes me more historically oriented. Uh, very early on in the Zionist project, um, the these the Zionists knew that this was a problem, 
and they called it the Arab question, right? which in a certain sense was just the transformation of the Jewish question, which gave birth to Zionism. And so the Jewish question is resolved by the Arab question. And they were very aware of that. And they wrote about that in the aughts and the teens and the 20s. There was a lot of conversation, not only on the left. And what ended up happening, from my perspective, is Zionism went from being a Jewish national movement to being an emergency. After Hitler comes to power in 33, after Europe starts to collapse, and that that very relevant question of the Arab question st is put aside because they entered into an emergency situation. How can we save as many Jewish lives as possible as quickly as we can? And the tragedy of the story, from my perspective, is that the Arab question never really came back. I mean, it came back in, in moments, like in Oslo, for example, you start to see that the Arab question really emerges. But it never really is taken as seriously as it was taken in the teens and 20s of the 20th century. And I think that we're living in the aftermath of the erasure of the Arab question as a fundamental challenge to the entire um, Zionist project. Yeah, and um, this actually leads me, uh, leads perf it's a perfect uh, yeah, <laughs> segue uh, to um, uh, the, the second question, kind of big question that I prepared and then we'll open up. Um, and so I want to name the fact, I'm very aware, uh, we are sitting here, three Jews, three Israeli Jews, really, uh, also you, Joel. <laughs> yeah. um, and, um, uh, and so the absences are very clear. And uh, and the kind of the conversation has been about um, Jewish politics and ethics and the realities of Jewish power and domination um, and um, th there are no uh, Palestinians physically uh, on this panel but I uh, but obviously uh, Palestinian experiences and realities uh, are very much at the center of this conversation. Uh, and, and interrogation and grappling and um, uh, atonement. Um, and so, uh, so I want to um, kind of invite you to talk about um, how, from your perspective, how uh, reclaiming and reimagining Jewish ethics and meanings, what does it mean to be Jewish? Um, what, what, what's the role of Palestinian history as Palestinian experience, the realities of uh, Zionism? What's the role of the moral demands of Palestinians in your kind of process of uh, reclaiming, reimagining the future orientation means, I mean, part of it, Michael, you want to reclaim your grandfather's um, Jewish ethics, um, but in a, in a different context, context of Jewish power. Uh, within a Zionist frame, as you said, we, we kind of established that. So, so, so what does it mean? And I actually, as Shaul was talking, I was reflecting on, um, you know, 1923, the Iron Wall, um, um, Jabotinsky uh, talking, you know, talking about kind of the, the very basic of the, at least naming it, not looking at the land as empty, but naming that, you know, the, the nature of the relationship is of, right. of power and domination. Um, so I wanted to kind of put it on that on the table, name you know what kind of conversation we are having, and bring those other kind of relational relational aspects to to the foreground. Yeah, I just very very I'm going to be very quick. I, just two two things. Um, last week I went to see Rashi Khalidi. I know some of you else were there, and he gave a very interesting reading of the Iron Wall, and he said that Jabotinsky, who was really kind of the patriarch of the Israeli. I guess right wing one would say it's not not the religious right, but the 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 right the of Likud. He said that 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 um, uh, that Jabotinsky was absolutely right in the Iron Wall when he said to his is Israeli or at that point um, not you know not yet Israeli readers, the Arabs will rebel against us because that's what people that are subjugated do. And this is, this is the, the thesis of the Iron Wall, therefore we have to create an Iron Wall to prevent that, but that people who are subjugated will eventually, will eventually rebel. 
And I wanted to couple that with something that Yosef Weitz, who was the founder of the JNF, the Jewish National Fund, Jewish National Fund, right? Lifelong Zionist, um, basically created this whole agricultural uh, world in Palestine in his diary at the end of his life. He said something that was very, very um, striking. Um, he became very disillusioned, by the way, in the 1950s. But he, at the end of his life, he writes in his diary, the Arabs will never forgive us for what we've done to them. It's fascinating. But he was also the architect of the quote unquote transfer policy. Of course, that was the irony, right? He was the architect of the transfer policy. And yet he writes this in his diary just the same way that Jabotinsky was the architect of a very, very militant reactionary position and yet really recognized. And I bring that up as a response to your question because I think that something that Michael does in his book and I think people on the Israeli left uh, are, are doing more than people on the American Jewish left, is recognizing the truth of both of those statements, of Jabotinsky's statement and of Weitz's statement, that the Palestinian narrative is a real narrative. And it's a narrative that, 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 that needs to be paid attention to. And it's a narrative that really speaks to a Jewish question the Jewish question of, 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 of your grandfather. That yeah. was created in Europe. That was created, that was created in Europe and then gets translated back. But the, the unfolding of the project itself, um, that question somehow became erased, forgotten, justified, invalidated um, through a course of, in part, Palestinian resistance, violent resistance, that emerges in various stages from, uh, from the first intifada to the second intifada to October 7th and everything in between and everything before. So th that, but that doesn't mean that the narrative isn't a narrative and it's something that needs to be paid attention to. And without the recognition of that narrative, any real lasting sustained solution is impossible from my perspective. Um, so sort of, yeah, so a, a, a couple of thoughts on, on that. Um, first, I will say that um, the last chapter of my book is, is a monologue, um, which, is, which is perhaps a weird thing to do from, from, from a Jewish ethical perspective historically, but the last chapter of my book is a monologue of a, of a Palestinian um, um, partner, a political partner and, and, and good friend of mine. Um, his name is Samir Swade. Um, it, it's important for him to talk about, and it was important for me, per, purposely to, to talk about the fact that he's not a Muslim uh, Palestinian, he's a Druze Palestinian, uh, but uses the language of indigeneity uh, very much in his um, perspective. And for me, it was important not only because it's important as um, one is constructing an, an ethic, a counter ethic or an ethic to, to understand what people are viewing you from uh, from 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 a distance or for beyond that uh, that point, but also because I think the um, if I want to understand, um, um, I'm I'm very much not romantic um, about um, um, the marginalized and the oppressed, even if my grandfather. Uh, in the context of this conversation uh, was one, or, per, or perhaps specifically because uh, my grandfather was marginal, marginalized and oppressed, I don't have some sort of romanticism of returning to that position of like being oppressed and being marginalized. That being said, if I want to understand his, marginaliz uh, his, his marginalization, I think we, um, we have a way to access that by people who are marginalized by us. And it was very important for me uh, to see how um, the community, the political community that I, the larger political community that I belong to, um, both tries to access that um, perspective of past marginalization, but also uh, marginalizes uh, currently. And um, and hearing uh, how Samer speaks about being both being uh, marginalized by the Jewish experience in Israel, uh, but also his deep love and connection to uh, the Druze diaspora around the world is something which is very 
sounded to me very, very similar to the Jewish experience. And I thought that was, um, for me, a way to explain to the people that I have a conversation with about, um, about what it means to be um, uh, uh, hegemonic and marginalized or what it means to be um, uh, an oppressor and oppressed um, in, in various degrees. Um, maybe if, I'm all, if, I, if we're already quoting around, uh, around iron walls, uh, and now I feel responsibility to the Zionist project, to quote um, Zionist, who I like. Um, so Amir Yalon, who is, um, um, may all past Mapainikim be like Amir Yalon. He's a former, um, a lot of things, uh, but also former head of the Secret Service. And um, one of the, um, I think, most humanistic voices coming from that world, uh, also regarding Gaza now, uh, one of the w one of the few and important voices coming from that world, uh, talking about the importance to um, uh, to both end what's happening now in Gaza, but also uh, um, to lead this into uh, um, full um, uh, uh, freedom and equality for all. Um, um, wrote a book a couple of years ago, and within it wrote that what um, the Israelis um, haven't understood regarding the Iron Wall is that while it might have been necessary to some extent in the past, um, the Arab world has accepted Israel since at least um, 2001, uh, 2002, with um, the um, first, uh, the, the Saudi initiative, and then uh, the, uh, the reification to that by most of the Arab world, uh, but has put a provision to that, which is that Palestine needs to be a state. Uh, and instead of understanding and recognizing that there is no need for an iron wall anymore. Israel has yet to understand um, that um, it, it, it has to pay prices uh, to be a democracy. Uh, but that, 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 that ship could have sh sailed years and years ago. And I, um, I say that now both because up until now we've been having, understandably, a conversation. And it is important to recognize that there is um, a terrible, terrible a tragedy unfolding um, uh, in Israel, uh, Gaza, Palestine, uh, as we speak. Um, and we're having a conversation in that context, um, but also because that lack of understanding that, um, uh, of, that, that of, of many of um, my people, that we can actually be in a democratic um, a scenario, but what that would entail is having uh, is is not being exclusivist uh, in our in our um, control of the region is something which is very pressing. Um, so it wasn't directly connected uh, to the question you asked. The Samar thing was, but uh, but I, I think it is important to recognize that um, that that in that sense the inability of Israel to and this I think very much connects to a lot of what Shaul writes about in his book the inability to say well. We don't need a JNF anymore. We don't need a Jewish agency anymore. We don't need all of these structures, which perhaps might have been relevant in the past, um, uh, is something which is which is also holding back the ability of Israel to to actually achieve, achieve its own uh, interests and goals, which is to normalize itself in the region. Um, Michael, uh, before we turn to uh, the audience, do you want to say a few words about the Faithful Left, the movement you are a part of, and, <laughs> and how it emerged and? So, so um, yeah, I kind of got, uh, I mean, on a personal level, I'll say this anecdotally, I got tired of organizing protests and then, uh, and then having somebody come to the protest, uh, seeing me and saying, it's so nice to see somebody like you here, um, uh, as if I'm a guest in my own community, uh, even if it might be their first time there uh, at a protest ever. Um, I think if you actually go to like, uh, anti-occupation activism in um, in the West Bank. There's actually a lot of people who come from uh, various communities, but there's a there's a high proportion of people who come from religious backgrounds for a lot of different reasons. Um, so that's on the anecdotal. On the more um, maybe depressing, um, uh, I think we are increasingly seeing as as Jews who 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 are opposed to ethnic supremacy for religious reasons. Um, I grew up in uh, a religious. I, I I grew up very happily in a in a religiously committed and very left 
um, home. Uh, but um, uh, religiously committed and very left people tend to send their kids to right-wing institutions. That's how I. That's how I would. I was treated. And that's how I treat my kids. Um, but when I um, when I was growing up, the, the project was the Greater Land of Israel, and a necessary byproduct was um, ethnic supremacy. And at this point, ethnic supremacy is the product of religious Zionism, and that. Um, increasing frustration and tragedy, and as it becomes more and more, um, as religious Zionism becomes more and more obscene um, um, and violent and aggressive, um, it becomes increasingly. It became increasingly clear to me and some and and other activist friends uh, that there needs to be a religious res religious political response to that. So the the faithful left was formed. Um, uh, exactly a year ago uh, after the election. It started with a conference. Uh, people kept on saying, oh, all five of you will come. 700 people showed up. Um, there's a conference in two weeks uh, as well. Uh, and there's also a, a book coming out in two weeks, three weeks of, of religious, um, religious left responses to the war. Um, I think in many senses it, it might be pushing the left forward on this thing, which um, I'd be happy to hear m more voices like that coming from the Israeli left at this point with all the complexities involved. Uh, but the faithful left is really an attempt to create a stream within Jewish thought and tradition uh, which is opposed uh, to ethnic uh, supremacy but also has a problem with um, economic inequality, gender inequality, um, other issues. Um, maybe one more thing to say about that is not it, we're, it's not only or maybe even not primarily people coming from religious uh, Zionist backgrounds. There are a lot of people who are coming there from Haredi or ultra-Orthodox backgrounds and from Mizrahi or T communities. Um, so the voices there tend to be different than perhaps the liberal, liberal religious voices of the past. Great. Uh, okay, so let's open up, see what questions um, are generated for, for you. I'll just continue. Um, Yes, hi, my name is Yael Mizrahi Arno. Um, thank you, Shaul. Um, I'll just continue on what you were just saying, though, um, because I'm curious, you um, obviously position yourself outside of religious Zionist um, theology and politics, at least. You mentioned it a few times, you, you have issues. So beyond the faithful left, which um, is, is very important and super interesting, um, I'm more curious about your book and I've seen it used um, in more traditional religious Zionist circles as a way to express a, a new strand of religious Zionism. Um, did you write this in mind um, that you would like to uh, create conversations within religious Zionism or is this for people who are outside looking in and have you had success with that and would you still call yourself a religious Zionist? <laughs> Sorry, that was... <laughs> I'm. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I can. Can I answer sort of like, uh, like I would answer. I, I don't. I don't. I don't put much um, thought. Uh, perhaps um, like like the bad cynical answer would be depends on the donor, but um, but the more serious answer would be that um, that I am. Um, living within, uh, um, you know what? I don't know. I, is, that a, is that an okay answer? I, um, I, I, but, I, but I should explain why. Um, it's becoming increasingly difficult to uh, position ourselves at the margins of this community. Um, I say that with great sadness. Um, you know, a lot of the teachers, it's always just comfortable to talk about uh, kids because that always points to the structural. Maybe I'll add there are four education systems in Israel, um, right? They're completely segregated. There is a Arab education system, uh, which is run by, not by <laughs> Arabs. It's run, I mean, it, it's overseen by, by the state. There's an ultra-Orthodox uh, education system, which is um, state-funded but private. Um, there is, um, it's, and which is irrelevant uh, to the life uh, that I live because I'm interested in knowledge from outside of my community. Then there's a secular Zionist education system, and then there's a religious Zionist education system. And when you have kids who are three, 
uh, you have to choose who you are. You have to be one of those four options. And that's really who you are uh, or who, um, till your kids uh, graduate. And of those four options, the option which is still closest, which will still make my children feel least odd is the religious Zionist option. That being said, a lot of the teachers of my kids have voted for Ben Gvir in the last elections. And when they find out, my, my friends, kids, my kids' friends find out uh, that uh, the kids are on the left, they'll say, like, what, like, Gantz? Like, Benny Gantz, that left? And then it's really hard for even to try to even explain sort of the position um, that we come from. So um, formally, um, structurally, just like I'm, a, I'm not much of a nationalist, but living in a nationalist time within Israel, I'm a pretty bad religious Zionist, but living within a religious Zionist space. But as I said before, that mandates of me to be also be um, loving to that community. And um, I can't send my children to a school and just and, and not have great love for the people who are spending their time, usually um, uh, in the Israeli context, teachers from a from from you know middle class to lower middle class background who are spending their time uh, trying to make my kids good people, um, and I can't come and just talk about uh, what what a terrible theology they subscribe to. I need to have some sort of dynamic which also loves the people who care for my children. Um, so that's the longer answer to I don't know. Um, I will say that it's it's becoming increasingly difficult over the last year to say that I'm in the margin of that community. And I'm also very not romantic about that community um, or very not optimistic about the community being able to reform itself so long as there's occupation. Maybe in one day, God willing, uh, when, um, when there end of occupation and Palestinians will have a right of return, and all that will be great. There will be a religious Zionist stream, um, which is more humanistic, but I'm aware that so long as um, we are positioned in the way that we're positioned, uh, religious Zionism will just continue doing Zionism religiously, uh, which is in this sense a, a, a negative thing. Um, okay, so. <coughs> um, my name is Jeffrey Lewis. Um, I have nothing to do with Harvard, but I'm very uh, interested in what you had to say and what you've written about. Um, Shaul, I, my question is really to Michael, but I was really fascinated by, <laughs> <laughs> I was really fascinated when you said that the left in Israel is far to the left of American Jewish left. It's a longer conversation. Michael, I, I wanted you to sort of round out what, what you started <laughs> to talk about, um, which is you know navigating two different communities. I mean, you live in a community in which you are at odds with the vast majority of the community politically. And then you go to the secular um, anti-occupation groups who are not, who are secular and well, in some ways- received I don't know. Well, and in some ways actively hostile to religious yeah. and to religion for reasons that may be legitimate. But I'm just curious how you navigate both sides. I think it's more of a temperament question than anything else. I'm a, you know, I'm I'm I, I'm a happy guy, <laughs> and uh, I navigated well. I I've had, uh, it's it's um, um, it's. I I don't view my political position, even though I mean uh, myself, Dotan, other people in this room. I'm sure we've we've had. Uh, a background of being, let's say, in more um, confrontational situations, and have, um, you know, been harassed by settlers and maybe uh, arrested a bunch of times. Uh, but um, it's a pretty comfortable experience being an Israeli Jew in Israel. Uh, I don't view myself as much of a dissident. It's uh, I'm I'm um, um, I, I I go home, thank God, to a place of safety. Uh, there are some things which are a bit uncomfortable about being a political activist, but mostly I'm just very happy that I have the opportunity uh, to be in that position. Um, I, I think our, our role is to, is to have a conversation and to educate. And if that's the role, then if we also need to listen um, and we also need to do it um, usually sort of um, um, uh, amicably, I think is the word. Um, but, uh, you know, um, 
I, I don't view it as, as much of a burden in that sense. Um, and I also think um, that there's something very important about not feeling completely at home. It's also a very Jewish concept of um, maybe not uh, only exile and diaspora, but the idea of gerut, the idea of sort of just not feeling completely comfortable where you are, is sort of a very strong ethical tradition. Uh, and I think there's a lot to that, uh, to saying I'm, I'm not exactly 100% comfortable where I am is a, is a good, healthy place to, to be. Uh, it's imp also important to note that with respect to the, the left, it's all often has been understood in Israel uh, kind of in a misnomer because the um, opposition to the occupation and with the occupation of yeah. the territories of 67 um, was often an Ashkenazi project and not connected to like what Michael is also doing in terms of your activism to other kind of like more left activism, labor, um, um, uh, issues of Arab Jews, Mizrahi, Ethiopians, um, all those communities that that um, you know their their struggles uh, in many <coughs> respects should intersect with Palestinian struggles. I mean, uh, analytically uh, at least. Uh, so, so the fact that I mean, in your, when you call yourself left, you co it's connected to. Other left. Yeah, I, I, when I say left, I mean a hesitancy of nationalism as a hesitancy of like um, more things, <laughs> like more um, like uh, accumulation of wealth and accumulation of power. Um, and in uh, you know, and um, there's um, there, there's also parts of like the Ashkenazi left which I like very much, and they're also my allies. But there are of course other other parts as well. So yeah. Yeah, and actually here I want to invite uh, Shaul in because you've done so much work on um, kind of the American Jewish uh, landscape uh, because p part of the kind of the exercise that we went through to differentiate, to, to, uh, to highlight the convergences and divergences between the kind of uh, hermeneutical work that you are both doing in your different kind of positionalities with different interlocutors, um, I mean, the, often the, the American uh, Jewish left that is anti-occupation is also very centrally involved in other kind of struggles that are very deeply and locally um, uh, US uh, located, you know, Black Lives Matter. And of course, it's also transnational and global, but we need to understand the situatedness of uh, American Jewish actors. And it, kind, of, kind of part of the exercise is really to highlight the, the divergences that it's not, we're not talking about one Jewish <laughs> struggle. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, and it's true. I mean, the difference is there's, there's obvious difference. The, the the Israeli Jewish left is part of a majority culture that is um, that feels responsibility and wants to engage the minority culture, whereas the Jewish left in America is the minority culture that's trying to be a part of uh, of of a majority culture, and that majority culture has been increasingly. And I'm not talking about over the last decade, but over the last 50 years, increasingly um, antagonistic toward the, um, the, the the Zionist project that many people on the American Jew or less feel a part of. A lot of that came out around the Women's March. A lot of that came out around the Dyke March in Chicago, where Zionist is becoming a litmus test for being a part of the progressive left. And um, and, and this is happening post October 7th also. And uh, there is a connection, and we talked about this a little bit in, in a class recently and, and, and something that I was doing yesterday. There is a connection between Black Lives Matter and the pro-Palestinian solidarity movement. And it's not, it's not reducible to anti-Semitism. There's something else going on. And I think the challenge of the American Jewish left is being able to kind of navigate a very difficult passage of being committed to the progressive issues that are part of the American Jewish left and also maintain a, an engagement with the uh, uh, Israel-Palestine, even if that engagement is complicated, even that Gabriel is sympathetic to the Palestinian cause. I think that for a lot of people, um, on the, in the American Jewish left to basically have to repudiate any relationship with Israel or Zionism to be admitted, that becomes the ticket of admission. That doesn't start with Black Lives Matter. That starts after the New Politics Conference in 1967, three, three months after the Six Day War, where, um, where somehow um, Israel was seen to be 
in the protocols of the New Politics Conference as seen to be a, a um, colonialist occupying power. This is literally three months after 19, June 1967. So it's a long, there's a long story to it. So it's a very different, I'm just saying there's a very different set of challenges that the American Jewish left has to has to uh, have to has to navigate. Yeah, it's important to illuminate because of the reductive way in which any kind of arguments about Zionism and anti-Semitism are deployed in in the current moment. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's see other questions. Maybe in the back over there. Okay. Uh, Jacob Board, uh, thanks so much for your comments and and these books. Um, I received this discussion as a fairly bleak portrait of the ability of these ideas to take hold in Israel. And I'm, I believe in the power of ideals, but ideals, I, 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 ideas have their moment. And their moments are created by context. And I'm curious, what will be the context and how can we in exile in the diaspora as Jews in the diaspora help create the context for some of these powerful ideas to take root? Yeah, okay. A question for Michael. I'm wondering if you feel like there's been any, any effort to push you out of the religious Zionist community, and also if you yourself feel like you have any red lines that it's at which point you wouldn't be able to be part of it. I have, my name is uh, Judith Gurevich. I have a very uh, silly question. <laughs> Where is Jewish guilt in Israel? Because we grew up with Jewish guilt. And I always wondered if in Israel it's something that has to be erased for life to start again. So I'm really curious to know because, you know, Larry David and all that, Jewish guilt is part of our lives. And <laughs> so how does it work in, in Israel? Jewish guilt is bad. The lack of Jewish guilt is bad. Yeah. <laughs> and I think we're seeing both sides of it. But it's more like in the context of Israel and kind of a broader discourse, it's about entitlement. Right, right, right. I was, I was yeah. Um, yeah, to take root, you know, it, it's, 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 it's a fascinating question. And um, I think that there is, um, there are two things going on right now. There is a war happening where people are dying and there's a narrative war happening about who owns the story. And that narrative war is happening in America on two different planes. It's, the, it's happening within the American Jewish community, and it's happening in the American progressive community. And I think that um, people that are on the, on the progressive Jewish left yet still remain engaged with Israel-Palestine, intellectually, emotionally, existentially, are really caught between these two planes of a narrative on the one hand being banished from, excised from the American Jewish conversation, being the un-Jews, as, as Gil Troy and Nathan Sharansky noted in their tablet article, um, or uh, from the, as I said before, the American progressive community, which is saying, you have any relationship to Zionism, you have any engagement with this, you're, you're not invited because that's a colonialist project that's killing people and so on and so forth. So in a certain sense, so how does that, it's a besieged, small besieged community, but, but interestingly, I'll end with this and give it to Michael. I mean, it's, and, and, and I, it's almost, I'm almost afraid to say it, but what the war has done has actually brought the progressive Jewish left to life. I mean, the numbers of organizations that have, that have just this exponentially grown out of this horrible war, whereas the American progressive, the Jewish progressive left in America was minuscule and was not a part of the conversation. All of these groups um, have, have just, have, have, have almost like come out of the soil so it, it's, it's brought something to life. And what part of what it's brought to life, I think, is as horrible as all of this is, I think that a lot of increasing numbers of young American Jews are coming to the realization this paradigm cannot continue. Something seismic has to change. And I think that's part of the project. Now, Israel is, is a very different reality, as Michael will speak to in a moment, because I think that Israel, the Israeli left 
knew this for a long time and 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 is is in a certain sense reacting but when you're in a war zone it's a very different template in terms of what can and can't be said um just to connect to that point i i do think it's it's still too early to tell um sort of this what's happening with this emergence of of a primarily young uh, Jewish left, uh, it's too early to tell because it's it's the the political relationships will which will or will not be formed um, in the coming months and years. Or you know we don't know yet. Um, I would like to hope, uh, and this is a challenge. I think uh, structurally, intellectually, um, for a lot of identity reasons, I would like to hope uh, that the relationship of um, the Jewish left to, to anti-occupation activism, to Palestinian freedom in general, recognizes that there, that it needs to be mediated through local local actors on the ground in the region, which includes um, Jewish Israelis. So I think um, it's too early to be frustrated. Uh, if I was to be frustrated, it's that 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 uh, potential skipping over of the Israeli left uh, by and saying we want to just directly work with the Palestinians. Um, which I think is actually um, sort of mimicking, in many senses, sort of the, the, the birthright problem, which is, you know, by virtue of us being Jews, we don't need the Israelis. We can just directly work with Palestinians. Um, but, um, but I think more sort of politically, I, I think this emergence, emergence can be potentially very beneficial if there is um, ongoing political conversation between um, Israeli, both Jewish and Palestinian left, Palestinian um, uh, left in uh, in Palestine and in diaspora, and the American Jewish left. Meaning that conversation can't skip over actors, um, and 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 hopefully it won't. Um, there's very much a difference of perspective. Uh, Shola and I were talking about this briefly before. I just got back from three weeks in Israel. It's very different. Just our positionality. Um, we're here viewing, uh, we're here viewing people in a ditch, and people in Israel and Palestine are in a ditch. And when you're in a ditch, you can't see outside of that ditch. And that, and and a lot of times, you know, I, I, I won't speak about others. I'll speak about myself. I'm I'm frustrated, let's say, with lack of empathy of Israelis uh, towards Gazans. But it's not necessarily lack of empathy. It's just people who are in a ditch and they can't see outside of that. So recognizing and understanding how different physical contexts uh, create um, um, different perspectives, um, we could actually be using that to our mutual benefit and not only judging each other. Um, you know, Israelis are frustrated that Americans don't recognize the ditch. Americans are frustrated that Israelis are in the ditch. But th the, the point is that we're just not seeing things from the same perspective. And I think politically, it would be very wise to just understand the perspectives and not just judging. Um, I, I will say uh, quickly about the red lines. Um, if there are political red lines, they've been crossed years and years ago. I think I've made that abundantly clear. That being said, just to make it um, more complicated, if like Ben Gvir, Smotrich, I know Marzel, uh, Fetterman, who's also attacked me physically, and a whole bunch of other people needed a tenth to pray for a minion, I'd join. Um, and that um, is because I don't want politics to dictate um, that conversation. Um, I join um, uh, any minion uh, of Jews. Uh, that makes me a problematic tribalist. Um, and maybe lastly, about guilt. First, uh, I, I direct you to the Breaking the Silence website. <laughs> um, but more, um, more significantly, I, I, uh, Shola has this great chapter in the book about um, critiquing um, uh, Daniel Hartman's uh, troubled committed, uh, committed and, uh, and the, the sort of liberal Zionist in, in general. I'm, I don't really care. You know, I, um, I, I don't. I, as long, you just show up to the protest. Like you can feel guilty, you can feel not guilty, you can be happy, you can be frustrated. Uh, the question is not what you do. Uh, it's it's what you do. It's it's less how you feel. If people are going to sort of like do like co-resistance work with Palestinians because they feel incredibly guilty, that's fine. If they have no sense of guilt but they think it's the right thing to do, that's great. I'm just I, I just from an activist perspective, I just want people to show up, um, and and their personal temperament in that. You know that I, I don't whatever wh whatever whatever motivates people to do to do the work. It's fine. They just need to do the work. Yeah. 
Michael, um, you talked about the ditch. Okay. Um, uh, but the ditch didn't, was not just dug after, uh, on October 7th and after October yeah, 7th. Yeah, of I mean, course. The ditch has been going on for at least 75 years. Oh, I, I, I'm not saying, I'm not saying uh, recognizing that needs to withhold judgment. No, 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 no. But with respect to the Israeli, Israeli Jews not being able to feel empathy yeah. um, or recognize the, really the humanity of Gazans, you know, that did not, you know, they didn't feel it strongly for 16 years when Gazans were under siege. And... You know, now it's ov obviously exponentially uh, elevated, um, but you know the ditch has been going on for for a while. In, in order to in order to, cre um, to to push myself on this as well, uh, when I say that about Jewish uh, recognizing the limits of Jewish empathy, uh, that that should clearly mean that that one needs to recognize the limits of Palestinian empathy, um, and uh, and um, and 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 I'm not talking and uh, you know there, there's this really frustrating thing where where Israelis are being saying like. Um, so, so how, what has changed in your mind after uh, Octo October seventh? I'm like, what has changed in my mind? I've we've been warning about this for like years. We've the, like the reckoning, right? Right. The reckoning. So, so, so th there's obviously a there's obviously a, a context to everything, and there's a context. Uh, there, there's um, there's an October six, as you as you said, and uh, in, in a seminar that we were in a couple a, a couple of months ago, um, that needs to be um, that, that needs to be dealt with in any any political. Uh, activists or any viewer of the situation needs to understand, but you know, there's there's um, there's a Jewish saying, which I imagine is just a human saying, which is "En shoftim adam b'shat saro," which is we need to also recognize. Uh, it, it, it it translates to you don't judge a person in in their time of pain, and um, and 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 that's I'm not saying we shouldn't judge Jews at their time of pain. We shouldn't judge or we should recognize. The time of pain of of obviously not only of Jews but also of Palestinians and their let's call it limited empathy towards Jewish suffering. So, thank you. <clears throat> My name is Sherry Flashman. I'm not affiliated or associated with the school. Um, I was wondering if you could just expand, Shal, when you talk about the um, American Jewish left who you are talking about, and when you say there's been an explosion of groups or coming of alive, who you're actually referring to? Um, um, well, I could keep it um, pretty local, actually. Um, there was, there is a, uh, a, a group at the, at the Harvard Divinity School called Jews of Liberation, which was a small group of, of about, I don't know, 10 or 11 students, I mean, some of them are here, uh, that, have, that has existed for a while. Um, it defines itself as a, a if, I, if I'm getting it right, a non, um, uh, non or anti or anti, Zionist. An anti, anti. Okay, <laughs> Zionist group. Okay, okay. How do you define yourself? Yeah. Okay, friend. Oh, I didn't see your friends over there. Right. Okay. Hello. Um. Oh. Oh, hello. Um, I'm Francesca Rubinson. Um, I'm one of the co-leaders, facilitators of a student organization here at Harvard Divinity that has existed since um, the fall of 2021 called Jews for Liberation. And we are a creative, pluralistic, um, warm, political um, space that is open to anti-Zionist Jews, non-Zionist Jews, and those questioning their relationship to Zionism. Right. And that's what we're, that's what we are. And just to, to add, there is an also an undergraduate group called Jews for Palestine. And there is a recently founded group in the law school called Sedek, which I, which basically I think goes according to those. Now those are new. Sedek is, is new. It just, it was just formed. So, just within this campus, you have three separate groups of young Jews who are defined as, as Fran defined them on, on, on this very complicated question. And if you go to other campuses, Columbia, Penn, Cornell, Michigan, Berkeley, you'll find other kinds of things. So there's something that's really kind of emerging out of the, um, uh, the, out of the ditch on some level. Yeah. Yeah, but it's been emerging for a while because... Um, There's more. I missed that. Yeah. Oh, more. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is what I was Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, I was just going to add... <laughs> I was just going to add that I think there's some you know, informal connections with, with JVP and with If Not Now and local uh, groups, but also I think that there's a range of 
of political opinions and positionalities within our group as well. But I just wanted to share that we had um, 50 folks gathered for a Shabbat dinner in recent weeks because, and there were many people there who said they had not had been felt comfortable or had the opportunity to be in a spiritual space of that kind with people who shared um, some what they felt were very um, important values to them right. ever before. So that that felt very important. It can I, can I say, as, if, as I know that there are Israeli leftists in this room, I think we should be viewing this as a tremendous opportunity uh, for dialogue and for growth and not just think about, wait a minute, why are they a bit different from us on this issue or why are they a bit frustrating on that issue, which is usually the conversation, the dual conversation between this uh, is actually, a, it's actually a, a, a really important step forward. Yeah, great activist and good, what can we do? Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to say that Yes, there is kind of an, um, a real like escalation of uh, uh, Jewish Palestine solidarity activism and activism across that spectrum that was articulated, including pe meeting people where they are in the process. But I studied um, this kind of like mobilization, uh, and you can you can actually trace spikes. Uh, uh, that are correlated very positively with uh, assaults on Gaza, 2008, 2014, 2021. Um, you know, this is not like you don't need to be, you know, a genius to figure out the relationship between those. Can I say one thing about this? Uh, so uh, I had a Zoom meeting last night of um, the synagogue that I am the rabbi of in the summer of about 25 or 30 congregants on this question. And for older, for an older generation, and by that I'm talking about myself, um, it's very, very vexing for baby boomer Jews. How can our children and grand, how can they think, how can they do this? How can they think this way? How can they identify this way? How can they affiliate? It really is, 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 is so difficult to under, for, for them to understand. And, and the way I explained it is, first of all, um, younger people, and this was true of me during the anti-Vietnam War days and as a lot of others, Younger people are much more interested in a certain kind of purity politics that ultimately very often overextends itself. However, as I said to these baby boomers, many of whom were anti-war activists, we actually ended the war. If we had listened to our parents, the war would have gone on for years. So there's an, something that's accomplished through that overextension. And the other thing that I said, which is really re relevant, is that I think, and I'm talking to a, an older crowd, the, the, the country Israel that you fell in love with 40 years ago is not the same country anymore. Your kids see a different country. And you can argue about which is more real and which is more fantastical, but the country that younger students see on their computer screens is not the country from 1970 or 1972 or 19, it's just a different place. Oh, I'm not deported, but I'm just saying within the experience of their own lifetime. So when you talk about Israel and when they talk about Israel, you're talking about a different place. Now it's not categorically different, obviously it's the same place, but the reality is a different reality. And, and, it, it, and there is a serious kind of you know, generation gap and inability to understand. You don't have to agree with the position of Jews for Liberation, but you have to realize that this is coming from a deeply invested, committed, activist place that is looking at a place that they find to be extremely, extremely problematic. Yeah, I think that uh, a feeling feeding... Uh, kind of uh, thought to to end with um, you, Shaul, you just articulated of um, yeah we you, we you uh, rebelled against the the parents uh, and you ended the war um, yeah, yeah? Uh, so maybe we'll conclude with that. <laughs> Sponsor, the Religion, Conflict, and Peace Initiative at Religion and Public Life. Copyright 2024, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.